Oliver Bergman, author of the book 4,000 Weeks, wrote a piece recently on his excellent newsletter, The Imperfectionist, called How to Forget What You Read. In it, he talks about how forgetting is a filter and that we can reframe reading as a way of shaping our sensibility. In other words, he thinks that we should give ourselves permission to forget more than we do, because reading shapes our predilections and our cognitive inclinations, even if we forget the ideas themselves. I'm really taken by this idea, but here's why I think it's wrong. In this video, I'm going to talk you through my current process for learning things in Obsidian and mount a four-point defense for remembering what we read. My first point is that complexity requires some sort of permanence. Remembering things and writing things down enables us to build upon past knowledge and construct more and more complex ideas. I do this through a variety of means, and I really like to consume a lot of different types of content. When I'm consuming content, one of the things I'm thinking about is, am I going to be able to capture it? Now, I don't try to capture absolutely everything that I consume, and I think on that point, Berkman and I are pretty much on the same wavelength. However, I do tend to prefer media that lets me take some of the highlights or, or so record somehow what I've read or what I've consumed. One source of information for me is articles. In this case, this is a text version of a presentation by someone named Tanya Riley. I use the Readwise Highlighter extension. It is a browser extension, so it supports Chrome and Chromium-based browsers. I am currently using Arc, but also supports Firefox, I believe. I just click on this and it automatically saves it to Reader and I can read it there, or I can just start highlighting from here. I can click on that, that is automatically highlighted. And because Readwise lets me have comments here, I can add something in the note. So I am already using Obsidian Syntax because I know that I have a note on Glue Work, for example, and I can save that. And when it goes into Obsidian later, I'm going to be able to see that link. I also still read quite a few books. I love fiction and nonfiction. I don't always take notes on fiction, but I almost always do for nonfiction. There are always more books that I want to read than those that I actually can read. So my first stop for nonfiction books is usually short form, if it's on short form. I really like short form. I have spoken about it before. It is like Blinkist, but way, way better because it's actually nuanced, intelligent information. So what I'll typically do is I'm going to look over the one page summary that they have for every book. I am currently doing that for the 12 week year, which I have not yet read. So I usually use the one page summary summary to determine whether or not it sounds interesting enough to read. And what I really like about it is that you can also send those highlights to Readwise. And you can see that my Readwise account is connected, which means that when I highlight anything here, I'm going to be able to see that in Readwise as well. You're probably seeing a pattern here. When I've decided to read a book, I usually read it either on Kindle or on Kobo. Now, Kindle is still my app and my e-reader of choice. I've had almost every iteration of the Kindle at this point, so I'm kind of tied to the Amazon ecosystem, but it's not so great for foreign language books. So for that, my kind of DRM free reader, as well as also connecting well to some local stores, is the Kobo app and Kobo reader. Luckily, both of those sync really well with Readwise. I've also recently started to get into podcasts, and that's mainly because I finally discovered a podcasting app that will let me take notes on it later, and that is Snipped. I've done a video on that, and you can check that out for details, but Snipped is an app, a mobile app, that doesn't just let you listen to podcasts, it also does AI-generated summaries and transcripts for you, which means that you can then effectively highlight things from a podcast and those get sent to, well, Readwise. I'm going to be saying this a lot, so I'm sorry about that. This is not sponsored by Readwise, by the way. I just, you know, I find it really easy to just have everything going to the one app. And right now that's Readwise. You might imagine that I also consume a lot of YouTube and you'd be right. I also just use the plugin to send YouTube videos to Readwise and it actually works pretty well. 
Let's go ahead and see what that looks like in Readwise. Now you can think of Readwise as a middleware sort of service. It accepts input from a variety of sources, books, articles, podcasts, everything I mentioned, and then also sends all those highlights from those things to a bunch of other sources, including things like Obsidian and Notion, where you can actually process the important bits from those. Now, Reader is a part of Readwise that collects some of that information namely newsletters, which I also get it sent to, PDFs and articles, all of that gets sent to Reader first. So looking at that YouTube video that I just sent, this is what it looks like. It takes the Google Translate captions of it, and then it makes it something that you can also highlight and take notes on from here. I really love Reader's interface. Check out this video that I already made where I just basically gush about Reader. I love it so much. Reader is also where I look at my RSS feeds. Yes, I still do use feeds for some blogs. And when I do, they all end up here. There's also emails here. I tend to have newsletters sent here. There's some PDFs. I don't do tweets anymore. And then here are some videos. Now, at this point, I already have quite a bit of information in Readwise, but there's way more information before that that I read and consumed that never even made it to Readwise. So I'm happy if some things don't move on to the next step, but a lot of the things that I do consume, I consume for a reason. And in that case, they do get moved on and processed further. Which brings me to my second point about why we should remember what we read. And that's because learning is about deliberate practice. Learning isn't about memorizing what someone else said. Learning is about holding that memory against the memory of other ideas and interrogating what they actually mean when put next to each other. It's about rethinking how things are structured in your head and it's about making connections. That kind of deliberate practice is not something that can just be naturally passively shaped over time. For the things that never make it out of Readwise because I just don't have the time, I use Napkin. I have talked about Napkin on this channel before, but let's have a quick look at it now. Napkin is a web app that uses AI to intelligently tag thoughts from Readwise. Now, you can actually tag thoughts even if they're not from Readwise, but I really only use them for things that come from Readwise. They have this thing called a daily mix where it shows you things that they've pulled in from your Readwise account and then you can just start tagging them. Anything that's blurred out is all automatically tagged. The more time you spend on napkin and adding your own tags and reviewing the automatically generated tags, the better it gets. So then you get to a point where you can click on something and it starts to show you cards that are not exactly the same, but maybe related. And I really love, for instance, that it even automatically tags things that are not in English. Like this is something that's in Spanish. I like this layer as a way to still be able to tap into the things that I found important enough to send to Readwise in the first place, but maybe not urgent enough to proceed to the next stage, which is going into Obsidian. I use the Readwise official Obsidian plugin to bring those highlights into Obsidian. You can see that there have been a lot of highlights that have been synced over the years because I've been using it for quite a while. Here's what the highlights look like in Obsidian. This is for a book by someone that I recently interviewed on the channel, Jorge Arango, for his book, Living in Information. Here are all of the highlights that I made on the Kindle. And here's how I start to process those highlights into a book note that I've written. I tried to have a structure for this, and this is called the Hegelian dialectic. The Hegelian dialectic is a way of understanding and explaining a premise or idea by attacking it with counter arguments or opposing ideas. So this is kind of like the concept of steel manning, where the intention is to strengthen the validity of the original premise by showing how it can stand up to criticism. I find it a useful and simple enough way to critically review books. So it consists of three things, thesis, antithesis, and synthesis. So the idea is that in thesis, you talk about the things that the author was trying to say, their main points. And then in antithesis, you talk about the things that maybe they didn't get wrong or other authors' points that counter this one's. And then in synthesis, you try to think about how they can come together. This one is still in progress, so it's not yet done. 
but I'm already starting to take things from this and abstract it even more and create more notes on it. So for example, this information architecture note is kind of like, sometimes it's called the structured settle in the settle custom methodology, or this can also be a map of content. Really what it is, is a page of links and it's my way of starting to piece together where information architecture fits in and its relationship to Zettelkasten, for example. If you're interested in the details of how I go from Kindle highlights to literature review notes to then other notes on the topic, then I just released a video to my Patreon where I just take you through the process of me going through just that for this very note, living in information. So if you are interested in supporting me, then check this out. Thank you all of the Patreons for helping me do the work that I love. Point number three for remembering what you read is sometimes you need concrete results. If you're a knowledge worker like me and you actually make tangible things based on what you know, then you'll know that you need specificity at some point. You need cold hard facts and steps to follow and techniques that will actually help you produce something. It's like, how do you deploy an app on Kubernetes? No amount of osmosis or gradually shaping things over time without remembering the steps is going to get you there. You're going to need to put in the work and that's not going to happen if you're just forgetting what you're reading. I'm a developer advocate for my day job, which means I sometimes write code, I deploy applications, I create test scripts, I also make videos, and I go to conferences, and I write blog posts, and I do some of those things for this YouTube channel as well. Something I really want to get back into this year is writing, my first love, which predates even my love for videos. I just released the first issue of my newsletter, Thinking in Public. It is free, so sign up for it if you would like. Now you can see that I produce a lot of different types of content and when you're in the content creation game and you're producing as much out there as I am, whether that's like a finished blog post or if it's just like publishing notes online like I do daily, then it isn't enough to have just some vague hazy idea of what I've read. It has to be founded on something solid and that's where my notes come in. My fourth point for remembering what we've read is that forgetting makes us cultists of the new. When we don't remember what we've read, then availability bias sets in. Our thoughts and opinions become the product of only the last 10 things that we've read, not the hundreds of things that we've read in the years past. And that makes us skew towards what's new and what's recent. And sometimes that emphasis is unwarranted. The premise of allowing things to shape us gradually over time, the way water eventually shapes a beach, is seductive because it requires very little effort. The book Deep Work by Cal Newport talks about how in a world of inattentiveness, what stands out is focused attention. The read and forget cycle doesn't encourage that, but you know what does? Remembering what we read and writing things down to help with that. Thanks for watching. Kusunum a